In this video, we're going to take a look at a number of things that are going to tie together many of the questions we've had and the things we've been working on up to this point. We'll introduce something called a tangent line and connect this with limits of the difference quotients that we introduced last time. So we'll begin by introducing tangent lines, and then we'll see how we can study these by studying limits of difference quotients. Let's begin by looking at tangent lines. We're really getting into the heart of differential calculus here. So we'll begin this by thinking about what the goal that we have in our study of differential calculus is. Everything we've done up to this point, studying secant lines and rates of change of functions has been working towards this goal, namely to calculate the instantaneous rate of change of a function. And all this business we're gonna look at now about tangent lines will accomplish this goal for us. The first thing we're gonna take a look at is how we can interpret an instantaneous rate of change graphically. We did this for average rates of change and saw that we can interpret them as slopes of secant lines, and we'll build on that here. After that, we'll turn to looking at difference quotients, and we'll see how we can use difference quotients to calculate instantaneous rates of change. So let's look at a tangent line. Say we have a function and its graph, and we have a line that is drawn so that it touches the graph of f at only a single point, call that point A, f of A. This is the kind of thing we have then. We have the graph of our function, that's there in blue. We have our point A, f of A, and we have our, our tangent line, which is here in red. And notice that the tangent line touches the graph just at that one point, and then they kind of diverge from each other. That line is the line we call the tangent line of our function f at a. By the way, just like with secant lines and the secant function, there's not any really important connection here to the tangent function in trigonometry. So don't worry about trying to find any connections like that right now. Let's see why tangent lines are useful. Now, if you look at the picture we just examined, you can see that the graph of the function in blue and the tangent line at A in red don't really look much alike. They touch at that one point, A, F of A, but other than that, the tangent line is going off in one direction, the graph of the function is doing something else. You can easily distinguish the two. But if we zoom way in and look very, very close around the point A, F of A, it becomes much harder to tell the graph and the tangent line apart. There is the same picture as before, but now zoomed in a great deal on that point A, F of A. And now notice that, except maybe at the very end of the picture on the left and the right, it's kind of hard to tell where the line is and where the graph of the function is. They almost overlap perfectly. That is the key for understanding how tangent lines work. The point here is that when we're very, very close to that point, A, F of A, the nonlinear graph, the blue graph that we saw, it looks a lot like the straight line. And since straight lines are much easier to study than nonlinear shapes, this gives us a way to treat nonlinear things as though they are straight lines. That's gonna be a big central idea of differential calculus. The most important thing for us right now is that around that point, A, F of A, the line and the nonlinear graph are changing at pretty much the same rate. If they look almost exactly alike, then things like their rates of change are going to be the same. So let's connect tangent lines to rates of change. Here's the key insight. The fact that the tangent line of f at a and the graph of f around that point a f of a overlap almost perfectly leads us to the following idea. We can define the instantaneous rate of change of our function at that point where x equals a to be the slope of the tangent line of the function at a. And what this means is that if we can find a way to figure out the slope of a tangent line, that will give us 
the instantaneous rate of change of our function at that point, which is what we're looking for. We run into a problem though, because when we're dealing with a tangent line, it touches our graph of our function at only one point. To calculate a slope of a line, you need two points, or at least you typically need two points. You need x1, x2, y1, and y2. So since we only know one point on the tangent line we're interested in, we're going to need a way to figure out how to find the slope of a line when we only know the coordinates of one point on it. This leads us to using difference quotients and their limits. Let's see how we can use limits to calculate tangent line slopes. So again, limits will allow us to overcome the challenge of knowing the coordinates of only one point on the line. What limits allow us to do is to, in effect, start with a secant line where we know two points and bring one of the points closer and closer to the other one until we can't tell them apart. And at least in many cases, we'll find that when we do this, the slope of the secant line as we move one of the points that defines it will get closer and closer to some particular number. And we can take that number to be the slope of the tangent line. So the way to do this analytically is to take a limit of a difference quotient. Since a difference quotient, recall, gives for us the slope of a secant line. And the limit then will bring the points closer and closer together to ensure that we're getting the slope of our tangent line. So this leads us to a formula that we can use to find the slope of a tangent line. So we'll start with the difference quotient for a function f at a. This is it right here. This is what we defined in an earlier lesson, right? Recall that a here is the x coordinate of the point that we know is on our line. H is the horizontal distance from that point or that x coordinate to another one for another point on the secant line. And then this expression here will define the slope of that secant line. So h here is the horizontal distance between the two points on our secant line. What we want to do is to make those points get closer and closer together. So we want the distance between them to get smaller and smaller and smaller. We want it to get closer and closer to zero. So we can do that using a limit. And here's the limit that will give us the slope of the tangent line of our function at a. It's the limit as h approaches zero of f of a plus h minus f of a over h. And that limit then, if it exists, will give us the instantaneous rate of change of our function at a. So let's look at an example of how to use that limit to find a slope of a tangent line. Let's say we we're working with the function defined by 3x squared, and we want the slope of its tangent line at the point where x equals 2. What we'll do is to take the difference quotient for our function at x equals 2, and we'll evaluate its limit as h approaches 0. And we'll be able to evaluate this limit by using the simplification method we have for working with limits. So here's the limit. We want the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 over h. Here, 2 is playing the role of a. It's the point where we want the instantaneous rate of change of our function or where the tangent line touches the graph of our function f. We're taking the limit as h approaches 0. And since we know what f of x is, we can do a little bit of substitution here. f of 2 plus h will be 3 times 2 plus h squared, which is letting x be 2 plus h. And f of 2 will be 3 times 2 squared. Now let's work on this limit by doing some algebraic simplification. If we square 2 plus h and calculate the value of 3 times 2 squared, this is what we get. We can distribute the 3. We'll combine like terms in the numerator. Notice that we have 12 minus 12 in there, so the constant terms will go away. And we're left with this here. All of the terms in this fraction have a common factor of h, so we can cancel that common factor. 
and we're left with the limit as h approaches zero of 12 plus 3h. Now this is a limit that we can find by substitution. We're dealing with a linear function here. Those limits can always be found by substitution. And if we substitute zero for h, we get 12. So the slope of the tangent line of the graph of y equals 3x squared at the point where x equals 2 is 12. Let's look at another example where we do a little bit more. We're going to find a tangent line that is an equation for it. This time we'll find an equation for the tangent line of the graph of y equals x cubed plus 1 at negative 1. That is at the point where x equals negative 1. So to find an equation for a line, we need two things. We need a point and a slope. The point will be what we sometimes call the point of tangency. It's the point where our tangent line touches the graph of our function. So that will be where x equals negative 1. And then to get the y coordinate, we'll plug negative 1 in for x into the equation that defines our function. And that ends up being the point negative 1, 0. So that's a point on our line. The other thing we're going to need is the slope of our line. And to find the slope of a tangent line, we use a limit of a difference quotient. This is the limit that we're going to use to find our slope. So in the numerator, we've got negative 1 plus h cubed plus 1. That is our function value at negative 1 plus h. And then after that, we have negative 1 cubed plus 1, which is the function value at negative 1. So all that in the numerator is playing the role of f of negative 1 plus h minus f of negative 1. And that's all being divided by h. Again, we'll work on this by simplification. In order to simplify, we need to expand negative 1 plus h cubed. There's a formula to do this. If you've studied binomial expansions in algebra, you might recall it. There it is right there. If you expand this out term by term, that's the expansion of negative 1 plus h cubed. Then we're adding one. And then after that minus sign in the numerator above, the negative one cubed plus one, that's equal to zero. So we can set that aside. Now we'll continue simplifying. To do this first, we're gonna simplify the numerator a little bit, combine like terms, clean things up a little bit, clean up some of those coefficients. This is what we get if we apply some of the operations you see there, like squaring negative one, cubing negative one, multiplying negative one by three, and so on. Again, our constant terms are gonna cancel. We have negative one as our first term, and we're adding one in our last term, so those will cancel. We can also cancel a common factor of h that appears in the remaining terms, including in the denominator. This is what we're left with. And again, this is a limit of a polynomial function, it can be found by substitution. So we'll substitute zero for H and we get three for our limit. So that is the slope of our tangent line. And that's what we were trying to find. We had our point, now we have our slope, we have everything we need to write an equation for our line. An equation for the line will be Y equals three times X plus one. This is in effect in point slope form, where y1 is equal to zero. That's why you only see y on the left. Let's take a look at one other little dimension of tangent lines, something called normal lines. So one thing we might wanna find is an equation for a line perpendicular to a tangent line. And this is what's called the normal line of f at a. So this is the line that goes through the point on the graph of f where x equals a and is perpendicular to the tangent line there. It's called the normal line. Normal is another word that is used sometimes for perpendicular. Um, you might recall the concept of normal force from physics. It's the same idea. So here we're relying on the fact that normal and perpendicular are often synonyms in scientific contexts. In physics, for instance, if you have an object that's being pushed along a rough surface, there will be some friction, and that is determined in part by the normal force, which is a force that is perpendicular to the direction of motion. So that's just another place where you might have seen this use of the word normal before. Now, the key thing for us, if we want to find an equation for a normal line, 
is that we know the relationship between perpendicular lines. They have opposite reciprocal slopes. So since we know how to find the slope of a tangent line, if we want to find a, the slope of a normal line for a function at a point, we can start by finding the slope of the tangent line and then taking its opposite reciprocal. Let's take a look at an example. We'll find a normal line. So we're going to find the equation of the normal line of 4 minus x squared at the point where x equals 1. The first thing we're going to need is a point on our line. Well, that'll just be the point where x equals 1, and our y coordinate will be f of 1, which is 4 minus 1 squared. So that's the point 1, 3. To get our slope, we're going to start by finding the slope of our tangent line. So you can see we're labeling this m tangent. Again, we're finding a slope of a tangent line. We'll do this by using a limit of a difference quotient. So what we have there is our difference quotient for our function f at x equals 1, and we're taking the limit as x approaches 0. We'll find this limit by simplification again. The first step is to do a little bit of algebra and arithmetic. We've expanded 1 plus h squared, and we've calculated the value of 4 minus 1 squared. If we combine our like constant terms in that numerator, we get this here. Now there's still 1 minus 1, so those will cancel. And then we'll be able to cancel a common factor of h in all of the remaining terms. And we end up with the limit as h approaches 0 of negative 2 minus h. That can be found by substitution. It's equal to negative 2 when we set h to be 0. So there's the slope of our tangent line, but we want an equation for our normal line. Well, the slope of the normal line is the opposite reciprocal of negative 2, which is positive 1 half. That gives us our slope. We have our point, and we can therefore write an equation for our line. It will be y minus 3 equals 1 half times x minus 1. 